Next on Oklahoma Capital Connection, we explore our state government with State Secretary and Director of Finance, Preston Dorflinger, and Insurance Commissioner John Doak. Hi, I'm Dan Shadell, the Executive Director of OETA, and thank you for joining us for another edition of Oklahoma Capital Connection. Well, my first guest is Secretary of Finance and Revenue, Secretary Dorflinger. It is great to have you here today, and thank you for coming to Oklahoma Capital Connection. Well, thanks for having me on. Dan. You bet. I appreciate you bet. it. Well, let, let's start off. Uh, we always like to try and start off to uh, find out a little bit about our guests and where they're from and uh, where they grew up. And, of course, um, you know, uh, I lived over in Claremore for quite a few years and then moved over here about six months ago. And, and I, I know that uh, you grew up in that area. So tell us a little bit about your early Early years. I did uh, grow up in, in Rogers County and uh, wouldn't, wouldn't trade growing up there for anything in the world. Uh, grew up in the shadow of, of Will Rogers. You can't grow up in Oolaga <laughs> and not have uh, Will Rogers' influence on, on your life. Yeah. So uh, great, great youth and great experience growing up in Oolaga. And you, uh, you uh, also, I, I think, uh, played ball there, is that right? Played a little basketball. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Guard, point guard? I was a point guard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the nice thing about being a point guard is you, you get to observe and, and, and take the, the landscape of the entire court. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about your, um, uh, your family. Uh, your family's from that area as well, and, uh, you know, how, how, well, we won't go there. Uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, your, your mom and dad, uh, you know, growing up, uh, you know, your, your wife, and you have a son, I Cross. do, I yeah. do, a nine-year-old son named Cross. Um, you know, I'll start with my mom because uh, she provided probably the best example of what it meant to work hard. Uh, she frequently worked four and five jobs to provide for my brother and I, and um, you know, we may not have had all of our wants, but we certainly had all of our needs met. And um, it was a great experience and a great role model to, to really learn uh, what hard work meant and uh, the, the value of, of working hard and, and being a producer in society. Um, my dad uh, was, a, was a Phillips guy when he started out um, in, in Bartlesville and uh, is an accountant by trade and has worked various jobs throughout his career. Um, and then I'm very fortunate um, in that I have my wife Jill and my son Cross and uh, uh, he's probably my, my greatest inspiration uh, daily. He's the, he's the best person I know. Yeah, well, kids, kids definitely are, aren't they? Well, let, let's, uh, let's jump right into your background. Uh, you uh, were uh, elected city auditor in Tulsa uh, a while back. 2009. Nine. Um, well, it wasn't that far back. It wasn't that far back. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, the, the gentleman who was in office had been in office for 26 years, a very distinguished guy, a respectable guy, a, a gentleman by the name of Phil Wood who had, who had served well in that role. But I think most people realized it was time for, for that role to change. And fortunately, uh, when I came in, we were able to do a lot of things uh, in the area of government modernization and increasing the efficiency of how government, uh, city government ran and realizing uh, savings for, for taxpayers. And that really, I think, uh, and the success I had there positioned me uh, for the governor to be interested in, in me and the role that I currently serve in. Sure. And, and that role is Secretary of Finance and Revenue and Director of the Office of Management and Enterprise Services? Say that four times. Yeah, times. right. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And uh, when I came into it. Sounds uh, like a big job. When I was first appointed, it is, and it grew. Um, I frequently say that Secretary Coffey tricked me because he, he played a role in me uh, uh, being part of uh, Governor Fallon's team. Mm -hmm. But when I came in, it was just the director of the Office of State Finance. And immediately that first session, uh, we had a consolidation bill that consolidated four other agencies with uh, the Office of State Finance, resulting in the Office of Management and Enterprise Services. Um, through that process, I was mandated to realize a 15% uh, savings on overall pro appropriated dollars, uh, which made a goal of approximately $3.2, $3.3 mil million, dollars, uh, which we fully realized in the first year of consolidation, approximately $4.4 .4 million, dollars, uh, which grew to close to $6 million in the second year. So. What it really demonstrates is that sometimes consolidation makes sense. Uh, through that process, you didn't hear a lot of teeth gnashing and hand wringing. Uh, most people realized that these were back office functions, government serving government, 
and that um, there was an opportunity to kind of break down some silos that existed within each of those agencies and, and centralize things like HR and accounts payable and accounts receivable and those those type of things. Wow. Uh, you know, so well, let's let's back up because it sounds that you know the experience that you've had uh, creating your own business and being kind of an entrepreneur and really looking at the you know as uh, someone that has the background that you have in finance. Um, how did you how did you come about that? I mean, was it just did it come natural? It, it did. I, when when the legislation passed, it, it it became apparent to me that this was really a high level merger, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, because the agencies that were going to now become divisions of the Office of Management and Enterprise Services were very diverse. Everything from Health Choice, being the state employees' health insurance program. Uh, to the Department of Central Services, which included things like fleet management and all of our state assets and central purchasing and central printing, um, to the HR function for the state, which was the Office of Personnel Management and had been led by Secretary Oscar Jackson for many years. Uh, those all became uh, divisions of the Office of Management and Enterprise Services. And then you can't forget that already existing within that office was our Information Services Division or the IT function for the state. Right. And so parallel to that agency consolidation, we also launch at the same time the statewide IT consolidation. Uh, is that uh, also incorporate uh, OneNet or is that a separate kind it's of separate. entity? Okay. It's separate. It's um, separate. We communicate with them and have good relationship. but. Um, it's a separate entity. Well, why don't you give, kind of in a, in a nutshell, uh, let's look at a, a day in the life of uh, the s secretary. Um, how do you wear both hats? And what, what, what's, let's say, a typical day for you, or even a typical week at the legislature? You have to have multiple personalities, uh, <laughs> which, which I frequently have to figure out which one which I'm one talking you're to, with, which one's right? talking to me. Yeah, okay. um, but certainly in, in, the, in the role of running the agency, and not every secretary has an agency attached to them that they're a director of. Um, in that role, I'm very much the, um, what I would consider kind of the chief operations officer of, of state government because so much of what we do are back office functions of just operating state government. Um, and then in my secretary role, that allows me to interface with the governor on the second floor as one of her principal advisors, and then also liaison between her and the fourth floor with the members of the legislature to advance good policy. Um, and right now, it's timely, I'm in the throes of budget negotiations. So we're working closely with the budget appropriations chairs to craft the, ultimately what will be the state's budget. Well, good luck with that. I'll toss up a prayer for you. Thank you. I know that's, a, that's, a, that's gotta be a, a challenging um, job in itself, just the negotiations and, and looking at budgets for uh, the entire state of Oklahoma. Well, why did you leave a successful private sector job and, and get into government? What, what, what made you decide to do that? I think there is an element of, and again, this comes from, from probably from my mom, that um, the idea of giving back. Um, it, the timing was such that I felt like I was in a place that I, that I could run for office. Um, I, one thing I'll say about that is it certainly makes you a better citizen. I don't know what else it does, but it, at minimum it makes you appreciate uh, the nuances of, of government, um, but the, the timing was right to, to be make a contribution. Uh, I certainly uh, have no intentions of being a, a career uh, politician or public servant, which I think in these roles is what should happen. You should have people ebb and flow into these roles and have fresh eyes and, and, and have some turn um, so that, that we have different perspectives. And it, it's easy in these roles to uh, almost get what I'll call the Stockholm Syndrome and you, you, you tend to drink the Kool-Aid and, 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 and you know, the, the bad thing is when you start believing your own press releases. And uh, for me, uh, when that happens, I'll know it's time to, time to go. But right now, I think I'm making a significant contribution and I'm, I'm proud, to be, proud to be where I'm at. Good, good. But on, on the flip side of that, um, uh, consistency or continuity is, is sometimes an issue and education and, and forming uh, new legislators or new people that do come in and that's a challenge in itself You know to making the, a smooth transition with new people it is and, and I don't think it's something state government does particularly well uh, Succession planning scares people in government and it makes it uh, makes people think about preferred selection for roles But I when I have opportunities like this, you know in, in roles like I'm in you are going to see people kind of come and go in these roles uh, but it, it's a, this is a great opportunity for me to give my impression of state employees. 
uh, I think state employees frequently get a bad rap. And uh, I can tell you that the only reason why this thing we call state government, with all its complexities, the only reason why it works at all is because there's a lot of conscientious people showing up every day uh, doing the best they can in, in the roles that they, they respectively function within. Well, you're one uh, who uh, decided not to move to Oklahoma City. You, uh, you commute almost every day, if not every day, uh, from Tulsa, correct? I do. Um, I have commuted virtually every day. Um, I, I'm usually up too early to, to bother people. There are select people that I like to call really, really early. <laughs> um, and, and others I try to leave alone and, and uh, listen to audiobooks. But the afternoon provides a great opportunity on that commute back to Tulsa yeah. uh, to return phone calls that through the day I'm not able to take from being in meetings. I understand, I understand. Now, uh, DHS, let's talk about the uh, Department of Health. Uh, when you came in, you were interim director of DHS, correct? Yes. Um, what was that like? I mean, that must have been a, a challenge for you and a, a different kind of a role, and, and there were a number of challenges that you faced taking over the uh, that interim position, correct? Well, that's the second time that Secretary Coffey bamboozled me. Oh. Um, <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, I was, I was um, proud to go serve. Uh, I do consider myself as the governor's utility player, and there was a need there. And I, I answered the call to go serve what, for what was supposed to be three or four months and turned into seven. Uh, my whole goal was not to serve longer than, than Henry Bellman because he served in that role. Governor Nye asked him to come back. And I beat him by 30 days. So <laughs> I didn't even succeed at that. It was a fascinating experience. And, and we did some great things in, in crafting the Pinnacle Plan while I was there and getting those initiatives started. Mm -hmm. um, to the point that we're starting to already see some real fruit of what of the of the seeds and the and the foundation we began to lay there. A perfect example is two-year-olds in 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 shelters. Uh, that's a practice that doesn't exist today, and hopefully we continue to have less and less children in shelters. But it was a goal uh, to not have two-year-olds residing in shelters, and that's a credit to our society. I, I made a plea that this was an all hands on deck issue. Uh, DHS are not going to solve the problems that face this state. And the citizens, as they do in Oklahoma, responded beautifully, and we recruited a lot of foster families. And DHS continues to do good work. Um, it's, the, it's some of the hardest work within state government. And nothing good happens from 2 o'clock in the morning phone calls from DHS. Um, it just doesn't. But um, it's, it provided great perspective for me back in my other role as well. And the, thing, and the challenges that DHS faces, the uh, challenges that other agencies um, face. Well, we've got about a minute left. Uh, this went really quick, and hopefully we can have you back uh, for a, a future segment. I'd love to. Great. Well, we appreciate that. Uh, state budget. Yes. I know that uh, you know we mentioned earlier that that's uh, something that right now uh, you're working on funding priorities, the economic picture. You know, in a really in a, in a brief, you know, soundbite moment, what are we looking at, and how does the economic picture for Oklahoma look? I'll make it really short. Okay. It's all good. Okay, it's all good. Uh, it's very positive. Oklahoma, I, I'm very proud of, of where we live. The fact that we function within a balanced budget and we don't write IOUs like a California. Uh, we should be very proud of Oklahoma and it's positioned right now uh, for excellence in every aspects, every aspect of society. Uh, it's a lot of positive momentum and we should be very proud to be Oklahomans. Well, on that note, thank you so much, uh, Secretary Dorflinger. We do appreciate all that you do for Oklahoma, and we wish you the best in uh, all of your future endeavors. Thank you. Bet. And joining me now is Oklahoma Insurance Commissioner John Doak. Commissioner Doak, welcome to Oklahoma Capital Connection. Great. Glad to be here, Dan. Thank yeah. you. You bet. Well, before we get started, we always like to start off a little bit about yourself, uh, where you were born, raised. Uh, your your family, your background, uh, what made you you today? Right. No, uh, I'm uh, I'm the youngest of five, uh, born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, my mom is in her 80s, lives in Tulsa, uh, keeps up with me on a pretty regular basis. My entire family lives in the metro Tulsa area, um, and it's uh, it's something that is is great to be a part of from the Oklahoma community. Went to Edison High School in Tulsa. Uh, my kids are in the Union District in in Tulsa. Uh, both very active in school. Uh, my wife is a stay-at-home mom, really takes care, enables me to do the job that I'm doing. Uh, my, my wife's name is Debbie. My kids' names are Casey and Zach, and very involved in youth sports. And my, my daughter's very interested to uh, 
uh, become a, a, an aspiring veterinarian. So, uh, great, uh, great. but uh, youngest of five, my family is uh, uh, all still lives in the Tulsa area. Uh, my father passed away in 1987, and I was uh, raised around the oil industry in northeastern Oklahoma. And my father was also a stockbroker. Oh, oil and gas industry. What uh, what connections you have with the oil and gas? Right. Uh, we had some stripper production up in uh, up in the northeastern part of Oklahoma, up near the Osage area. Uh, okay. It, for those that don't really know anything about oil and gas, stripper. The stri the stripper production. It means that uh, the the wells which my family had basically produced less than uh, a barrel or two a day. Uh, they were basically kind of in the runoff area, but uh, kind of aggregated those, but. I, I grew up with the opportunity of spending a lot of time on weekends with my dad and, uh, and his family out drilling wells and, and learning a little bit about that industry. Uh, so it's a, it was very exciting to, uh, to grow up in and around and, and plus being a stockbroker, uh, he had originally encouraged me to get in the insurance business. So uh, uh, here I am today. Well, great, well, great. You, you mentioned earlier that uh, you still stay in touch with your mother and very actively uh, engaged. How do you stay in touch with her? Facebook? Uh, you well, tweet believe, her now believe it or not, my mom is on all those. She's, <laughs> oh, she's, very, right? she's very active. Wow. She's, uh, she's on Facebook with all the grandkids, but uh, really very helpful to me with the senior issues around the state of Oklahoma with my mom and her friends. And uh, she's got a, a nice group of ladies that uh, keep up with her. Uh, but again, to be in touch with some of the senior issues around the state, um, you know, she always asked me, you know, am I doing my best to take care of Oklahoma seniors, which uh, I think we're doing a very good job, and that's a very high priority. Good, good. Well, uh, tell us a little bit about why you pursued a, a career in, in, in insurance. Sure. I mean, I was, uh, went to the University of Oklahoma, had the opportunity for to be in a class there with uh, Henry Bellman, who was a political science major, was one of my uh, professors, and Neil McCaleb uh, taught a few of my classes there. And, uh, I, I was really pretty enamored with politics from a very young age. Uh, when I was on the campaign trail, it was a, a speech that was pretty hard to follow uh, around the state of Oklahoma because I could say that I was actually published in one of Ronald Reagan's memoirs. Uh, I'd, I'd written him a letter when I was young. I didn't find out till I graduated college that my, my letter was in, his, uh, in one of his memoirs. So uh, I've been in, in, interested in politics, and it just seemed like it was the right time, you know, uh, after praying about uh, opportunity and being involved in the insurance business and learning uh, the multi uh, different areas that I had the opportunity to kind of move my career up through the insurance side of things, um, I really felt like after much prayer that it was an opportunity to seek public office and uh, insurance is something that I know and with the, the things that were coming down in the 2010 election with uh, Obamacare, health care, I felt it was a time that someone really stood up for conservative values in the insurance office because I knew that there was going to be many issues that were going to be at the forefront of the insurance department from workers' compensation to health care uh, to uninsured motorists and we've tried our very best to address those areas and really spent quite a lot of time around the state of Oklahoma being in every county of Oklahoma every year that I was in office because when I ran for office, folks would say, well, we don't know what the insurance commissioner does, and you're probably never going to come back to, uh, until it's time for re-election. Uh, and so I was, I've been able to prove them wrong and really listen to Oklahomans all over the state. So I'm very proud of that. Well, uh, well speaking of that, this is a good, good place to maybe segue. Uh, elected in 2010. Yes, sir. And uh, was there a, a mandate at the time, you believe, uh, coming into office? Uh, by the people of Oklahoma in regards to uh, issues surrounding insurance um, issues because I mean they're so broad whether it's uh, Affordable sure. Care Act whether it's uh, uh, uninsured mortist uh, you know uh, consumer fraud the list goes on right and on. well I really felt that there was a there was a unique opportunity many people in the state of Oklahoma did not even know we had an insurance commissioner didn't know what they did and didn't know the influence or impact that you could have behind the scenes with things happening on a national level and on a state level. And I'm one of the few insurance commissioners in the United States that actually have, have ever worked with a consumer across the dinner table or an executive group across the boardroom, made presentations to corporations, but also understand how insurance affects and impacts uh, your average Oklahoman with their home and auto policy, life insurance policy. So I feel like I was in a unique situation to communicate really my conservative values and good policy. Okay, well then uh, that's that's a good place to ask, uh, what does the insurance commissioner do? Sure. What does the commissioner um, do for the people of Oklahoma 
and your your day-to-day -day operations? Well, first and foremost, the, one of the areas that I'm most proud about is our consumer services division. We've got, at the Oklahoma Insurance Department, we have uh, many, many talented individuals that work at our department, which I'm very proud to represent. But we receive approximately 30,000 phone calls a year from every county of Oklahoma, close to a million hits a year on our website. And those are questions from, uh, you know, homeowners uh, questions to health insurance questions to long-term care questions to um, we've had a major storm. How is my insurance company going to take care of me? So to be able to have that strong consumer protection edge and to understand the rights that consumers have and make sure that the insurance companies are really uh, taking care of consumers and following through on the promises that they make is something that I'm very proud about. So, so uh, if a consumer is uh, feeling as if they're not getting the kind of results they, they feel they are due from their insurance uh, company, right. they can contact you and sure, your they, office? Sure, they can contact us. We've got field reps. We developed a field rep system around the state of Oklahoma where uh, folks, no matter what county they're in, we can come visit them, meet with them in a senior center, meet with them at a local chamber of commerce. We can gather their, their insurance uh, complaint or question, work with them there, where they don't have to drive all the way into Oklahoma City or Tulsa. But again, to be out there on a regular basis speaking to the Chamber of Commerce and, and working with uh, the counties uh, is something that really connects me with Oklahoma in a unique way because they now know that they have an advocate that will get things done, follow up. Again, every time you flip on the, on the TV in the middle of a Thunder game or something, you're going to hear uh, an insurance commercial. And we're very proud of the insurance industry in the state of Oklahoma. But when, it, when time comes for a major catastrophe, like what happened in Woodward, Tushka, Piedmont, around the state of Oklahoma, we want to know that those consumers are being taken care of in a very quick manner. Well, we're, we're running out of time real quickly. Yeah. <laughs> this goes fast. Um, a, a couple of uh, key things that you're, you've been uh, working on, uninsured motorists, uh, consumer fraud, workers' comp, of course. But as we talk about weather-related issues, because sure. weather is a big issue right. in Oklahoma, uh, you, you have rapid response teams, yes. is that right? Yes, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when we're going to have weather in Oklahoma. And we've got our fraud unit and consumer services division, our rapid response team that can be anywhere in the state of Oklahoma on pretty short notice. Uh, for example, Woodward, Spavanaugh uh, recently happened, Tushka uh, area, Piedmont. We can get there and make sure that we're handling insurance claims, working with the industry. But the message is, when our office gets there, the insurance industry, the companies know that they better show up pretty quick and start handling and taking care of Oklahoma consumers. And again, they do a very good job, but it sends a strong message, which other states, I think, are beginning to duplicate. Okay, uh, uninsured motorists. Uninsured motorists, uh, there's been some new legislation. The folks watching this show, I've yet to be in a room uh, with any amount of people around the state of Oklahoma that have not been impacted by an uninsured motorist driver. We have approximately 560,000 drivers on our roads right now that do not have insurance and I was just in Stroud earlier today and I had the folks raise their hands and in a room of about 30 people 10 raised their hand that said I've been impacted mm -hmm. so we're working with the capital our legislators to we can now tow cars and there's a new legislation to remove tags a very innovative system that we tailored after the state of Louisiana so we're really taking bites out of that apple but we've tried education with our partners in the media uh, which has done, which has worked very, very well. But now it's time to really enforce that because uninsured motorist impacts all Oklahomans. And, and this is under the Oklahoma Insurance uh, Consumer Bill of Rights. Correct. Can you touch yes. base on that real quick yes. about we, the Bill of Rights. We kind of codified Title 36. Uh, we felt it was very important to to pull together uh, the statutes so consumers know how they're supposed to be treated by their insurance company. And a few highlights of that are weather-related claims. How is it, can I get a surcharge from my company? Um, how, how can an insurance company use my credit score? How long can they w keep an automobile accident on my record? Um, there are some five or ten key things, again, that are in statute that we pulled together and we're going to push those out to consumers and to agents where we know these are questions that are on their mind, especially after major disasters, so we put, to, put them together in the first ever Oklahoma Bill of Rights for Home and Auto, which I think is, uh, is you know, I'm very proud of that. And that's on your website? Yes, sir, it is. In that website? Yes, it is oid.ok.gov. Uh, OID that's easy to remember. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, we have just a couple of minutes left. I wanted to ask you real quickly on uh, the health insurance. Right. 
as uh, it's going to impact all of us. Yes, sir. Uh, how how does your office? Uh, how are they going to coordinate that? How what is it that Oklahomans need to know? getting ready to, to go into 2014. Sure, well, we're gonna have a federal exchange. Oklahoma is, uh, uh, we've opted out of, uh, we, we voted uh, on that in 2010. Uh, we're waiting to see some of the AG's opinions that are gonna come down in a lawsuit, which he's working on. Uh, we're very proud of the, of the general and the, and the lawsuits which he's bringing. But again, the, we will have a federal exchange in the state of Oklahoma, and we're monitoring that at the Oklahoma Insurance Department, uh, but we're going to wait and see um, again, the Affordable Care Act, really, I think in the last week or so, it's becoming more and more apparent it's just an act. It's no longer affordable. And we're looking for you know, further guidance and direction from the governor and folks at the Capitol that are doing a very good job. But uh, we're going to wait and see. Again, this is you know, what Washington is kind of driving through to Oklahoma. And we're going to wait and see what happens. But the Oklahoma Insurance Department, we're going to keep doing our job for Oklahoma consumers related to the consumer activities which we're responsible for and watching to see what happens with the federal exchange. Okay, Commissioner, we've got like 30 seconds left. Final thought. Final thought <laughs> is really appreciate the opportunity to be yeah. here and Oklahomans, if they have a question or concern, one of the issues that we're really fighting is exploitation of the elderly. So if there's someone watching the show that feels like someone is being taken advantage of, please contact our department. We take those very, very seriously uh, and we'll be happy to get back with anyone at any part of the state if they feel like they're being taken advantage of yeah, by their insurance company. It just company. seems like they're, you know, with the advances in new technologies and everything right. that we're just um, uh, a, a society that there's so much information out there about us now. That's true, very That true. Uh, they can just access that and it's really probably easier for consumer uh, fraud to happen. And when I'm out around the state, many folks come up and they tell me some things that are very personal that, and those are very good because if we find those uh, systemically across the state, we can, we can begin to track those. Great. Well, thank you so much. We're all out of time. We want to appreciate you for being here today, and we want to appreciate you for tuning in and watching Oklahoma Capital Connection. Uh, we ask that you share your questions or comments on uh, about this uh, program by calling us at 1-800-879-6382 or email info at oeta.tv. You can also find OETA on Facebook and Twitter. And that wraps up our first session of Oklahoma Capital Connection. We will return in 2014 with all new episodes. And until next time, I'm Dan Scheidel, and this is your Oklahoma Capital Connection.